Hey everyone, in this week of Computer Science 340, we're talking about a new data structure, which is the heap. Now, a heap is a data structure that solves a pretty specific problem, and that problem is when you have data that you need to keep track of, and you want to be able to add to the data quickly. And instead of wanting to search through the data, like with a hash table or a binary search tree, the problem that a heap solves is when you want to be able to get the next biggest item out of the heap as quickly as possible. That's called a max heap, when you want to keep track of your data and get the next biggest one as quickly as you can. You can also make a min heap, which is just the opposite. It's when you have a bunch of data and you want to get the smallest item remaining as quickly as you can. So a max heap and a min heap are uh, use the same logic and data structures. It's just you would like flip around the greater than and less than symbols and things. So you can implement both of those concepts with this heap idea. So heaps serve as a basis for a sort of more general idea of a priority queue. You can implement a priority queue several different ways. You could do it with an array or a link list. And what a priority queue is, all that means is that you have data and you want to assign some priority to them, to each value, and you want to process them like in priority order. So when we talked about queues, we talked about how a queue keeps track of data and you process them in a first in first out order. A priority queue is a similar idea, except you process them in priority order. So if you were doing like a hospital check-in system or something for the patients to be able to see the doctor, you probably wouldn't want to use a straight queue and just take people in the order they came in as, because if somebody has like a much more grievous injury, you would think that they would have higher priority and be able to see the doctors more quickly. So this priority queue idea, you could implement it lots of different ways, but the best way is with the heap, because again, you use the priority as the values in the heap, and then you can quickly with the heap take out the next one as quickly as you can. So we're going to start by talking about different ways of solving this priority queue idea, and then we'll move into talking about how the heap works and how it is so efficient. Heaps are actually based on binary trees, just like binary search trees, except the rules for governing the nodes are quite different. So a binary tree can be used to kind of uh, implement lots of different data structures. But let's go ahead and start talking about this priority queue idea and why using a linked list or an array might not be the best choice. All right, let's start by talking about ways we could solve this priority queue idea using things that we already know. So again, in the priority queue, you want to keep track of data and be able to insert new items. And you want to be able to dequeue the value in the priority queue that has the highest value. So one way we can do this is with a sorted array. And so if we're keeping track of numbers in our priority queue, we can make an array and keep it in sorted order. So let's put some numbers in here like that. We have some data filled into our array. And now let's imagine that we want to insert things into this. Well, some items will be quick to insert. Like if we want to put a 45, we would stick it into the next slot and it would keep the sorted order. However, let's say we want to insert something like a value three into the array. Then to maintain the sort, we would have to go ahead and put it in this slot. And that means everything has to scooch over one. And we've already talked about this idea before. On average, we're gonna to have to scooch down half the array to do this. And because there's n items, that's like one half n, which is big O of one. So inserting into the sorted array is big O of n. Doing the DQ, however, from this is quite easy. We just go into the furthest right slot that's filled up and take that value out and then remove that one from the array. That's quite fast, that would be big O of one. So if we have the sorted array, DQing, taking the biggest item out is very fast and easy because it's sorted, we know exactly where the biggest item is gonna be, but inserting is not fast, it's big O of n. Let's consider an unsorted array or a linked list instead. So the analysis for these two is the same, and so I kind of grouped them together. In both of them, inserting now is quick, because to insert into the linked list, we just need to make a new box, fix up a couple of links, and then put the new data inside of there. So if we're going to insert like 50, let's say, we would just go ahead and put the 50 here. Likewise, inserting into the array is going to be easy and quick. We just take the next available slot and put the 50 there. Because it's not sorted now, we don't have to concern ourselves with like putting it in the right slot. And so the insert then is big O of one for this case. But now maybe predictably DQ is not going to be very good because we need to get the biggest item out. And so we're going to have to scan through the linked list or the array looking for the biggest item remaining. And then in both of these cases, we would have to scan through the whole thing to find it's 82. 
and then removing it from the linked list is relatively easy. We have to fix the nodes, but in the array, we have to copy everything back over one. But just the scanning and searching part takes big O of n time. So it's big O of n to do the DQ in these cases. And so the new data structure we're going to talk about today is the heap, which is geared towards solving this problem. And it is big O of log n for both of these. So just like a binary search tree does really well with inserting and searching, heaps do really well for this problem where we want to insert and then we want to find the biggest one quickly and remove it out of the data structure. That's what the goal of heaps is. So now let's start talking about what a heap is and how it is actually implemented. So first I'll say that we have in computer science this thing called the stack, which is used to keep track of local variables inside of methods. And then we have a stack data structure and the two behave in a very, very similar fashion. The stack that holds local variables is a data structure stack because it has pushing and popping in this last and first out behavior. But we also have a heap in our computers that stores the objects that are allocated dynamically in Java with the new operator. And we also have this heap data structure, but unfortunately they have nothing to do with each other. The names are used totally differently for those two things. The way that the heap data structure works bears no resemblance to the heap that your objects are stored on. Just kind of one of those weird uh, terminology quirks, I guess. So how does a heap work? What does it look like? Well, as I mentioned, it's actually a type of binary tree. And so as a binary tree, we have this sort of thing like this, where we have nodes with two, zero, or one children. Heaps have different rules entirely than binary search trees do though. If you remember the way a binary search tree works is we have some kind of number in here and we have rules that say everything to the left of this node must be less and everything to the right of this node must be greater than the node in question. And that's for a binary search tree, not a binary tree in general. And heaps are a type of binary tree where this is no longer true. Heaps instead have different rules. The first rule for a heap is that it must be perfectly balanced and left aligned. So this is not true of a binary search tree. As you saw, we can end up with binary search trees that are very, what's uh, called degenerate, if you remember, where they aren't balanced whatsoever, but heaps, it's sort of like baked into the definition of the heap that it has to be perfectly balanced and also what I'm calling left aligned. That means that you can have a heap like this, but you can't have a heap like this. Even though this is just as well balanced, really, it's not left aligned because this node here has no children, whereas this one to the right of it has two. So basically it has to be like as shifted to the left as possible if you draw it out graphically like this. So that's the first rule. The other rule is that nodes have to have values greater than both of their children. And so if I put a number in here, like 88, then both the left child and the right child have to have values less, well, uh, if we're doing a max heap, which I guess we'll start talking about this, assuming that we're doing a max heap, we have this rule here where the values under 88, the two children have to be less than 88. That makes it a max heap. For all of this, we could just do it the other way around, in which case it would be a min heap. But we'll stick with max heaps to make it a little bit less confusing. So I could pick any two values under the 88 and that would make it a correct max heap. So let me go ahead and say this value is 65 and this one is 72. Now there's no particular relation between the two children. It doesn't matter that the lesser one is on the left or anything like that. We could just as easily do it the other way around. Just like for binary search trees, these rules like apply to all of the nodes in here. So the 65 also has to be bigger than both of its two children. So maybe I'll put like a 51 here and a 48 here. And like I said, this is still correct. We don't have to have the left and right child being like related to each other in any way. They don't, it doesn't matter like that. So I can fill out some other data. Let's put a seven down here, a 23 down here, a 35. And literally it doesn't matter so long as it's less than 48. I can put uh, a 10 here and let's go ahead and put a two in this node and a 56 in this node. And again, it doesn't matter here that the two is like at a level higher than these numbers that are bigger than it. As long as it is less than its parent, that is all that matters for the heap. So I think that we can see a few things. First of all, the problem of dequeuing from a max heap 
is sort of simplified because we do not have to search the data structure to find the biggest item. The biggest item always has to be at the root of the tree. And that's true because these rules like sort of cascade down. So if everything under the 88 node is less than 88, both of its children, and the children of the 65 and the 72 have to be less than 65 and 72 respectively, it like serves to reason that the biggest node has to be in the very root position. And so we're going to talk about a couple of operations on this thing. One will be doing this DQ operation. And what that means here is that we're going to have to remove this 88 node from the tree and return it back because in a max heap, you take the biggest thing and get it out of there, returning it back to the caller. Also, we'll have to talk about inserting because if we want to insert something, we're not necessarily going to insert things that are less than 88 or 65 or 72. We could insert like a 90 into this, and then we would have to shuffle these things around such that the 90 becomes the root of the tree. And so those are the two major problems that we're going to have to tackle with these. We're actually going to get into those in the next video though. The remainder of this video is going to be talking about how to implement a binary tree like this using an array. When we talked about binary search trees, we use the sort of like linked data structure a la a linked list to implement it where we had these nodes and inside of the node, we were keeping track of the data and we were keeping track of the left and right pointers like that. You can use a linked data structure like this to implement trees, or you can actually use arrays instead. And so it's actually possible to maintain a binary tree laid out inside of an array where we're going to store all of these items actually inside of this array. We could have done that with binary search trees, but I think we'll do it here just so you can see like sort of both ways of implementing binary trees, either a linked data structure like a linked list or with an array. And I think it actually makes sense to do this one in the array because of the first rule here, because it's perfectly balanced and left aligned, we're not gonna be having a bunch of gaps in our array. It's going to be using the beginning part of it. And so it's gonna be a really compact and efficient way of representing this. So let's talk about that now. How do we implement a binary tree? How do you store an array and figure out like what's the child of what and who's the parent of who? So doing this is actually pretty straightforward for the most part. We're going to start by putting the root into slot zero. Then we're basically gonna read this left to right. Both children of root go in the next two slots. So 65 will go here, then 72 will go here, 51, 48, two, 56, 7, 23, 35, and 10. And that's why having the heap be perfectly balanced and left aligned like this makes sense because then we're not wasting extra space. The next thing would have to be the left child of the two node, which is going to go into this slot here. So now we have another problem to solve though, which is we need to be able to find based on the index of a node, like three here, we need to be able to find where the left and right children are of this node. So in order to start tackling this, let's observe that level zero of the tree is here, level one of the tree is here, level two of the tree is here, and then level three is going to be comprised with these next nodes here. So we have one item here, two items here, four items here, and then it would be eight items here. There's space for eight items anyway. They aren't all necessarily filled right now. So what we need to do now is we need to basically write routines that do things like this and say int left of int node. And here the ints are these indices here. So it would take in the three in this case and then return to you the seven because just coincidentally seven ended up in slot seven, but here it should return the index seven based off of this. And we'll also write a method called write that takes in an int node. And based on the index returns you the index of where the right child is going to be. So if we pass it in three for this node here, it would go ahead and it would return to you the eight because 23 is the right child of 51. So let's start by doing the left one first. And I think that it seems complicated here, but it's actually not gonna to be too bad, I don't think. So let's say n is our node and then left is the child. So we have a couple of nodes with left children. We have node zero, which is this one. We have node one, which is this one. 
we have node two has the left child and we have three and four also have left children. And then let's think about what index the left child of each node is in. So in this case, 65 is the left child of node zero, which is in slot one. Then child one's left child is the 51, which is in slot three. So this is like sort of coming up with the function that we want this method to compute. We have example data here, and so then we can sort of reverse engineer how we find this formula. Node two is the 72. It's in slot two, and its left child is in slot five. Node three is the 51. Its left child is in slot seven. And then node four is the 48. Its left child is in slot nine. So look at this and see if we can find a pattern here. Think about it for a minute and pause it here if you don't want to find out because I'm about to say it. All right, if you're back from pausing or just didn't uh, bother or maybe you figured out it already, it's basically two times the node plus one. That will give us the mapping from which node index we are on to the left child, what index that is stored at. You know, two times two is four plus one is five, two times three is six plus one is seven, two times four is eight plus one is nine. Hopefully that makes sense. We can do a similar thing for finding out how to find the right child, or we can sort of observe that the right child is always stored directly after the left child. You know, the 72 is stored right after the 65, the 48 is right after the 51, the 10 is right after the 35, and so on. So really it's just going to be one more. So we can return two times node plus, oops, not plus one, but plus two in this case, which should get us there. Hopefully this is making sense. Now we can do one more thing, which is actually something we didn't have with our binary search tree, which is a way to find the parent of a node. If you remember our node structures with the binary search tree only had references to the left child and the right child, they didn't actually have one back up to the parent. That's something we could have added, but it would have made everything just a little bit more complicated to maintain those links. But with this method of storing it in the array, it's actually pretty straightforward. We can just come up with another little expression that will give us this. For this one, I will come up with the little table again so that we can hopefully suss out what the correct formula for this is. Zero node doesn't have a parent, but one and two do, and they're both node zero. Likewise, three and four both share node one as a parent. Five and six share node two. Seven and eight share node three as a parent. And I won't continue, but it follows the same pattern here. So what code could we write in here that would allow us to get to the parent node based off of the node index. So that if you pass either three or four, it'll return you one. If you pass either seven or eight, it'll return you three and so on. Again, pause it here for a sec if you want time to think about it. Okay, so moving on, all we have to do, I think is do the node value minus one, divide it by two, and this is taking advantage of the fact that in Java, integer division truncates, and so it rounds down. And so if you think about it, one minus one is zero, zero divided by two is zero. Two minus one is one, one divided by two is zero, again, rounding down. Likewise, three and four, if we subtract one, that's two and three, and two divided by two is one. Three divided by two is also one, rounding down. And so I think these formulas here work. And so we're going to pick this up in the next video, and we're going to start implementing the heap as a class that keeps track of all of the nodes in an array like this. And these methods are the things that we're going to be using to jump around from node to node and traverse our tree instead of following node links like we did with the binary search tree. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll pick it up in the next video where we start implementing this and we also then turn to putting in the insert and DQ methods. So thanks.